Uh, welcome everyone to another AI Research Byte. As always, we are um, very glad to have you uh, with us today. So the AI Research Byte, if you didn't know, uh, is a short series of short and informative talks showcasing cutting edge research work from ServiceNow AI Research Team. The AI Research Bytes are open to all, especially those interested in keeping up with the fast-paced AI research community. Our target audiences are AI practitioners and PMs working on AI products. So today's session will feature a 15-minute talk from Valentina Zantudeski and will be followed by a 10-minute Q&A. As always, you can ask your questions using Zoom Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, as I said earlier, so today we welcome Valentina, uh, a research scientist in the Human Decision Support Team and an adjunct professor at Université Laval. She completed a postdoc at New University College London and her PhD at University of Lyon. At ServiceNow, she's involved in the project around causality, retrieval, augmented generation, and time series analysis. Today, she will talk about causal discovery with language models as imperfect experts. Up to you, Valentina. Thank you, Fanny. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for organizing the research bytes and uh, for the help with the present with the, um, preparing the presentation. Um, so as you said, I'm going to present this work that was a collaboration with uh, colleagues from ServiceNow, Alex and Alex, and also Stephanie and Tibor from McGill University. Uh, before uh, diving into the paper, I'm going to give a brief introduction of causal discovery and trying to explain why ServiceNow should care about that. Before starting, um, the standard disclaimer, the content of this presentation is uh, to the best of my knowledge. So we all know that correlation does not imply causation, but what that, does uh, that statement mean exactly? So I put here two examples of uh, two pairs of variables that are usually statistically uh, correlated. You see, for instance, here, like um, uh, the presence of white fire is also is usually correlated with the presence of firefighters on scene. Um, and for instance, you know, a wine of good quality is usually also has a higher price. But um, so we have these uh, uh, dependencies between the variables that we observe, but they don't allow us um, to actually know how to act on them so that, you know, uh, to make the world better, let's say. Um, the, for instance, you know, uh, just by starting from these associations, one might uh, come up with a strategy of you know, saying that just reduce the number of firefighters to reduce the risk of wildfires, uh, which is uh, paradoxical. Um, or we could also have a strategy that is suboptimal, like saying uh, always buy the most expensive wine, even though there's not, it's no guarantee that is actually uh, the one uh, that is going to be the best. Um, so, in, so this is why like uh, associations alone are not enough, and this is why causal reason, uh, reasoning is critical uh, for decision making. So in these situations, uh, actually logic tells us that, that maybe the strategy about the firefighters doesn't make sense, but it's not always that obvious to see what is the cause, what's the effect, and how to act on them. And so uh, this is why causality is important. Uh, and I'm gonna dive now in another example that is more complex and is also of interest to service now. So uh, you might be aware that women are underrepresented in, uh, in tech. And it is actually one of service now goals for 2025 um, to increase the representation of women across the organization to 34%. And to reduce this gender gap, there are many strategies that uh, are possible. One of them would be to set a women quota. Um, and this strategy is quite easy to implement. Uh, I mean, by that, I mean that you don't need to change your screening or sourcing processes. You just need, let's say, to see, um, to decide that uh, from now on, like uh, half of the uh, new positions must be filled by women. And so 
Uh, so it's easy to implement, and also you will see the effect of this strategy uh, quite uh, fast. In a few months, for, for instance, you will see your uh, gender gap reduced. But the problem with this strategy uh, is that uh, it's also harmful in the long term. Um, because um, if you just hire based you know, uh, on the gender criteria, uh, of course, that will result in, a, um, in reducing the quality of the new hires, which is bad for our company, uh, but also like it's bad for the uh, people involved as well, because in the long term, it reinforces the stereotype that women are less good at the job than men. And also for the women hired, they, they always have this doubt that uh, whether they were hired, uh, hired because they were women or uh, and not because of the value they bring to the company. And from a causality uh, reasoning point of view perspective, uh, the problem with this strategy is that it, it tries to act directly on the fact of the problem and not on its causes. So a better strategy would be that like, uh, act on the causes of gender gap. And, um, but of course, this is easier uh, said than done because it's a very complex thing to do. First of all, you need to identify all causes of factors. I put here a few, but there are many more. And, uh, and ideally you want to act on all of them. But even though you're able to identify um, all the causes, Sometimes it's not even possible to act on them, like uh, um, because maybe it may be unethical, or maybe you can, you know, service now is not in the position to act on them. Um, the other thing is that uh, you know some policies will have really delayed effects, like uh, for instance uh, by encouraging women to uh, take on STEM studies, you will see the um, the effect on gender gap only years later. Um, so so yeah. Causality and decision making uh, are complex problems, um, and at, in the research team we are trying to tackle in them. The work I'm presenting today is focused on the uh, on the first part, like the identification of causes, uh, which in technical terms is called uh, causal discovery. And uh, causal discovery boils down to this: like uh, you have a set of variables of um, yeah um, causes and factors. And you want to identify all the relationships between these variables. Like, and you can represent this by in with this graphical model, uh, where each node is a variable and uh, each edge represents the direction of causality. So for instance, here we see that X uh, is a cause, is a direct cause of Y. The other minimal, uh, meaningful information in the graph uh, is also the absence of edges. For instance, here, there's no um, direct uh, link between H and X. And uh, classically, there are um, two main ways of uh, discovering the graph uh, of causality. One of them, it would be to you know, ask an expert. And the expert is maybe uh, they have ex uh, past experience uh, on, the, on the problem uh, or they studied it. So they can give us hints or suggestions of what are the uh, relationships between, between the variables. The other way is to uh, apply a data-driven algorithm directly on the data. Let's say you have you know, the observation of different people, different candidates um, that you're screening. You have their characteristics, and maybe you have whether they were hired or not. Um, and using that, and there are different ways, different type of algorithms that allow us to discover uh, these uh, graph relationships. Um, both these approaches have limitations. Just to cite a few, um, um, for instance, the expert, it might be expensive to hire one or it might be difficult to find one um, if it's a new problem as well. Um, the other thing is they might make mistakes and be very confident about them. And so we would, you know, um, after following their recommended policy or recommended suggestions, we would find only then uh, if the, um, by seeing that the policy actually is not uh, effective as expected, that we would realize that there were errors um, uh, in this in this uh, process. Of course, also data-driven discovery algorithm make mistakes. Uh, in particular, for instance, when we don't observe all uh, the variables, um, 
but also in the best scenario, um, they don't always allow us to disambiguate all direction of causality. Sometimes there's um, some uncertainty on a given uh, type of relationship are uh, present in their output. So our approach uh, try to combine the two, to, you know, to improve on each of them. And so we start from the data and we apply a data-driven algorithm uh, on the data to get a graph. And for instance, here it will return, you know, a set of uh, certain edges that we don't question, mm -hmm. and another set of uncertain ones uh, where we don't know exactly what is the direction of causality, what is the cause, and what is uh, the effect. Um, and so we query uh, the expert only on these uncertain edges. So we reduce the space of possibilities. Um, and uh, the expert will tell us like um, their suggestion for uh, the uh, direction of causalities and also the confidence uh, they have on each of that. And technically we could stop here. Like we could accept everything that the expert tells us and. Uh, uh, and direct um, um, the graph completely based on this. And this is actually one of the baselines we compare with, and you will see results for this one later. But the problem, uh, as I said before, uh, is that we cannot um, completely uh, trust the confidence maybe the, of the expert. Uh, we know that they might make mistake. So this is where um, our approach comes in. Like we combine both um, the data output and uh, this um, uh, suggestion of orientations. And we try to estimate ourselves, what is the probability that each of them is actually correct? And we do that with Bayesian inference. So what we do, at, we um, estimate uh, the probability that a given uh, direction is correct. And then we select the one that is most likely to be uh, true with the highest probability. And we add it to our graph. So we direct to that edge. And we do this iteratively, like in the second iteration, we um, recompute the probability, we reestimate this probability of being correct and select the one with the highest probability and add it to the graph. But we stop whenever our estimate uh, that we are making an error um, um, is. Um, um, is uh, below a certain uh, tolerance um, constant eta, which is fixed by the user. And is the uh, user, you know, um, it, it um, corresponds, it expresses how much the user is willing to take risk. Like, um, because the higher the probability of error that we estimate, the more likely it is that there will be errors in the directions that we return by uh, with our approach. And so um, our approach works well um, in, for a particular setting, only if that particular problem uh, is aligned with the assumptions that we make here. Okay. This, uh, we make this um, mainly to these two um, assumptions. The first one, we assume uh, that um, we make assumptions on the data generating process. So for instance, we assume that uh, the variables are related by linear relationships. Um, and, um, and based on those assumptions, we choose a data-driven algorithm that aligns well with them. So that is um, uh, known to be, um, to be able to discover the um, causality links um, uh, if these assumptions are true. The other assumption and assumptions we do make is um, that the expert uh, gives us suggestion that are conditional independent. What I mean by that is that um, if um, it gives us a, a, suggest, a, suggest, a suggestion, sorry, that X is a cause of Y, that is independent of whether Y is also the uh, X, um, a cause of Z, or so it's completely independent of the other variables. And we make this assumption because it allows us to query the expert only with two variables at a time and without uh, giving the description of the rest of the variables. So in our results, we experimented with two type of experts. Um, as the title of the paper suggests, we, uh, uh, we are using large language models for that. And in particular, TextaVinci 2 and TextaVinci 3 uh, from OpenAI. 
Um, and this is the prompt um, we use to query these experts that we know that they, they're good, they're not perfect, they're going to make a mistake. Um, so for instance, here, if you want to um, uh, query it about whether lung cancer causes cigarette smoking or, or the opposite, this is the prompt we give. And the expert will return us the probability of each uh, possible direction of causality. Um, so we, um, here um, we use both. Uh, so our method, we plugged, it, uh, we plugged uh, in these um, LLM experts. Uh, but also we compare with just you know the baseline where we just accept whatever the LLM expert um, tells us. And the other expert we um, we tried is a simulated one just to validate actually our approach. Uh, this simulated expert what does is to just wrong, uh, return wrong decisions like wrong um, direction of causalities with a constant error of uh, epsilon. And in the experiments you will see, uh, we have experimented with epsilon equal to 10% or also 30% error rate. And we, we use this to validate the approach because this expert is aligned with our assumptions. While it, we, it might not be the case with the LLM expert. Unfortunately, uh, we couldn't experiment with uh, the job gender gap problem because most of the data, is, like that data is sensitive and is not available, like publicly available to us. So instead we experimented with Asia and insurance. I uh, will be happy to, happy to give details about these data sets if you're interested. And we measured uh, principally two metrics. The first one is just, you know, the error rate, um, but we include also like uh, the number of undecided edges as errors. And um, for our method, we compute computed this metric for different level uh, of, of uh, tolerance. Remember, this is like um, uh, the willingness of the user um, to take risks. And the main uh, takeaway from these results is that um, we are able to improve uh, over you know, the base, uh, the simple baseline of, you know, just accepting whatever the expert uh, tells us. The other metric uh, we checked uh, was to validate our, you know, estimate of the probability of making an error. And so we compare, like, that is, our estimate is on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we compute, like, the, the actual rate, number of times that uh, the final graph return, returned by a method is correct. And ideally, if our estimate is correct, uh, we would have all the points of a method uh, above the diagonal that is marked with the dashed line here. And it is the case for the epsilon expert because as, as I said, like this is aligned with our assumptions, but it's not always the case with the LLM experts. Uh, in particular with the text da Vinci three, uh, you can see that we are uh, way below the uh, diagonal. And it's because this uh, LLM is overconfident. And as, the, um, um, as it is overconfident, our estimate is also distorted. Um, so I hope that I convinced you of the, um, uh, of the critical role of causality and causal discovery uh, for decision making. Uh, to conclude, I would like just to say that our team is improving on this work. In particular, you know, instead of trusting completely the, ex the expert confidence, try to estimate what um, is their expertise and include that uh, in our algorithm. Um, and otherwise, like our team is actually actively working on causal uh, causality in general. Uh, we have ongoing projects on causal discovery with neural networks and uh, causality from time series, for instance. So if you're interested, um, please do reach out to us. And thank you for your attention.